since it's one, let's let's get started. I think there will be people entering the room as we go on, and and actually it's just me, so so I'm kind of like doing multitasking. So if I take a break, it's it's really to to let pe- more people into the the meeting room. Um, but uh, but to give you um, an idea of what the Change Maker Institute is. Um, It's an institute that I founded. So my background, um, a little bit about myself, I'm a law, a full-time law professor and I'm a scholar and my background is in intellectual property. So so Shuba, who's here, knows me in that capacity and and a few of my students as well. And what I have come to realize about a lot of the work we do as academics is that there really isn't much of connection between what we do as academics and the business world. And the Changemaker Institute, I kind of founded it um, at the encouragement of a, a mentor, um, Tom Madsen, to, um, to bridge academia with business. So um, the mission of the Institute really is to, we, we do so much work in law, economics and philosophy, especially ethics, um, but a lot of what we do is is in isolation, right? Or, or we, we tend to have academic conferences and then the, the conversation in the, the literature stays within, within that, that, that field. And so what I'm trying to do is bridge academic research with the business world, specifically as it relates to social, social impact and social change. And the mission is to inspire businesses to be agents for change and create social impact. So traditionally, we've always we've always thought of social impact, um, you know, and, and social change as being the purview of the the government um, or nonprofit organizations or um, foundations. And so, what what I'm trying to do with the Change Maker Institute is get businesses. Um, so entrepreneurs and, and business owners to actually think about how they can create change through their business, right? And, and, and we've always known businesses to have an impact on society one way or another. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is encourage businesses to think about creating positive impact. And so what we're trying to do is provide processes uh, funds, we, we are actually in conversation with um, some people in finance to see about potentially starting up an impact investment fund um, to fund social innovation. Um, so hopefully that, that can come to fruition. And of course, connections, because it's so important to be well connected in order to make um, like um, we cannot we cannot do that individually. So it's really good, it's really important to form collaborative partnerships and strategic alliances in order to um, achieve a common mission. Um, I have the, the web page, which is the pre- preliminary web page in, at, the, at the last slide, and you can visit us. Um, but this is generally the mission that, um, that we have for the Changemaker Institute. So, so because it's so new, I'm trying to um, um, highlight the, the institute. And what I've planned over the, the summer is to have summer events um, to initiate conversations about social impact. And I've um, planned it every two weeks um, in over the summer. So June 14th, June 18th, uh, July 12th, July 26th, August 9th, and August 23rd. Um, so for for the for the summer for for June, what I what I'm planning for is for today we're going to talk about social impact and what that looks like, um, and then in two weeks we're going to talk about how social enterprises can actually be fi- financially sustainable, and and I think this is such an important conversation that we need to have because those are the two keys that will create sustainable social enterprises. That means that means enterprises that are actually uh, making an impact in the world in a positive way and and being finan- financially sustainable. So I did put up um, an article that came out in um, 2015 in the Harvard Business Review, um, and it's called The Two Keys to Sustainable Social Enterprises. And if you haven't read it already, I, I really encourage you to read it because it, it lays out exactly the two issues that need or the two the two things that need to happen in order for 
a business to create um, um, social impact. So today I will be leading the discussion and on um, the next one, I have a really good friend, Naya Nocera, who is a, um, who is a, he, he spent 20 years on Wall Street, um, but now he runs a, a Wall Street training institute called Precision Trading Labs. Um, and he's going to lead us through the discussion on what, be, what, um, financial sustainability would look like for social enterprises. So I don't know, um, I just talked to Ryan earlier today. I don't know if he's here yet, um, but he said that he would be here. Um, and I wanted to introduce him to, to get to, um, you know, to let you guys know what, what's um, lined up ahead. So Ryan, are you here? No. Um, he's not here yet. So I think he's going to join us. And when, when he comes in, um, I will introduce you to him. But anyway, he is going to take us through the discussion on what, um, what financial models are available to so social enterprises so that they can be financially sustainable. So those are two things. One, creating measurable impact. And number two, being financially sustainable. And, and the more people that I talk to who work in the, the space, the more this is becoming apparent to me that, that people who actually have money, um, they kind of struggle sometimes with creating measurable impact. So I recently talked to a, a, venture, a formal venture capitalist who was trying to make investments in, um, in providing healthcare services to the, to the poor. One of the, one of the problems she faced was the money that she had wasn't being directed to to actual impact, like like if the the impact that she was having um, or, or her venture capital firm was having uh, wasn't as impactful as she had hoped. Uh, so so that that's one issue about about creating the impact. The other issue, of course, a lot of a lot of social entrepreneurs face is well, how do we become financially sustainable? Um, and, and Ryan would be able to talk more about, about this on, on the next uh, session. But Wall Street is now catching up to how important it is to fund socially um, impactful enterprises as well. Right. So this, this is the, um, the structure, at least for or the plan for this um, for, for the month of June. The plan for today is I, I want to keep my remarks short and I really want to have conversations with you about about what you think about social impact and how we can, as um, businesses, um, you know, engage, uh, you know, use use business or uh, business practices to actually create um, sustainable impact. So what I'm going to talk about is one: what is social impact and why it matters. So I wasn't sure how many of you here are involved with social impact. Um, so I I just wanted to to get a sense of um, first question is what where is everyone um, connecting from? So, so Sagonia, I know you're in, in England. Um, ah, Ryan just got in, um, but but just like a quick a quick um, a quick feel for where everyone is calling from. And first question, and then second question is how involved are you with social impact? So that I kind of know whether I need to go into more detail about what social impact is, or if whether we can skip skip through that. So Richard is calling from Ohio. Kathleen is from Austin. Montreal, Calgary, New York. Oh, Gary, Gary, you're here. Ah, precision, a uh, precision trading labs. That's that's um, that's Ryan. So Ryan, I know we were we were trying to. Um, get you to talk about what um, uh, what what you have in yeah. store for us next um, in the next session only when you're ready when you're ready uh, let me know just send, send me a message and um, we'll have you on so Claudia is here Claude I work with Claudia on um, the sustainable development goals I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a little bit but she's from calling in from Miami. Shubas from Houston, Dallas, works in upstate New York. Craig, yes. I've known Craig for a really long time since I was a student at Stanford, um, and he's calling in from San Jose. 
So, okay, right. So Ryan says he's ready. Um, I want to go back to the slide um, about being fi financially sustainable and, and have Ryan talk a bit about what um, he has in store for us um, in the next event. Ryan? Hey, everybody. Hi, Alina. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be brief so that way you can get into your presentation. I'm sorry a few minutes late. I had some technical difficulty. Um, but just to give you my background, I've worked on Wall Street for 17 years, I guess, almost 20. And uh, next, our next session, I will be talking about uh, being financially stable in your nonprofit and the different models we can use. Like I'll give a, uh, a grooming bank style, um, Thomas Shoe style, and I'm going to get into the, uh, the real math and metrics behind each and um, kind of give a background on so different sustainable models we can use on the financial side to keep your nonprofit going. And, you know, uh, if you can raise enough funds to, to deliver the service that you want for the people you're trying to help and um, do that in a sustainably, financially sustainable way too, um, you'll, be, you'll be able to help more people and stay in business a lot longer. So I'm gonna get into a couple of those models in a little bit more detail at the next session. Thanks, thanks Ryan, yeah. so. So that's the other, um, the other key component to creating sustainable social enterprises. And we'll talk about that in two weeks time. Um, so thanks, thanks so much, Ryan. And thanks um, for the gift of your time um, um, and, and energy. Um, but as back to the agenda for today. Um, yeah, so we have people from all over the world. I, I remember thinking that um, there was someone who was calling in from uh, from Kenya, I think. Um, I don't see her here, but she was. Uh, she she told me that she was coming today. Uh, so we have we have different people. We have people from different parts of the world um, in this call, um, and I I wanted to talk about social impact and why that matters. So I, I'm not sure how many of us here spend a lot of time on what that means. Um, and why that should matter. Um, but I'll, I'll just go over the basics and then and then when we get to the conversation, then we can, um, I guess, up the, 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 um, <coughs> the, the issues. Um, but, but that's the first thing that I wanted to do. This, the other second thing I wanted to do is, is think about what a social enterprise is and how they create large scale social impact. So, so when we talk about social enterprises, uh, Ryan was talking about nonprofits, and a nonprofit is one of the entities that can create social impact. But when we talk about a social enterprise, it's 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 largely a larger group of um, entities. So you can have a nonprofit in working in partnership with a business, but together they form a, an enterprise an enterprise or a collaborative effort to create that mission. So we'll talk a little bit about a social enterprise and how they can create how a social enterprise can create large scale social impact, and then. Um, I want to leave the last half hour of the um, of the event. Uh, I know that someone has their yeah. So if everyone could mute them, themselves, I don't know how to do that on my end. Um, but yeah, so that we don't get feedback. So the other, the, the other issue, the last issue that I wanted to, to engage in conversation with all of you is, is your stories and your work on, on um, social impact. Um, and to get the conversation going of why we need to think about, about um, how to create um, social impact. So the first thing I wanted to, to just briefly go over um, is what is social impact? As a, as a concept. So as an academic, you know, we talk a lot about externalities and externalities are really the, the, the effects that a business or an activity has on society that isn't factored into the cost of that activity or the production of that, the good. And I know I have a couple of academics here on the, the call, Christoph is here and uh, you can jump in and, and um, and talk about externalities, um, but but essentially that's the that's 
that's the definition of what an ex that that's a definition ec economic definition of what externalities are, and when we tie that back to social impact. Um, an externality can either be positive or negative. And that's the way with social impact as well. You can either create a positive externality or a positive impact on society through your activity or your business, or you can create a negative impact or a negative externality on your business. And usually the cost um, that's born from that externality usually lies on it is transferred onto society, right? So that the benefit or the cost of that externality is usually transferred onto society. And the issue that academics usually try to solve is, well, how do we factor in the, the, the price of that, that benefit or that, um, or that cost into the price of the product or the activity, right? And usually that's, that's a really difficult thing to do because how do we measure or how do we quantify the impact that an activity is having on society, right? So the, the definition of social impact is the effect on people and communities that happen as a result of an action or inaction, an activity, project, program, or policy that is not reflected in the cost of the activity. And, and that's what we generally mean by externalities. So, you, so I have here as pollution being one negative external, externality of the business, right? So nobody usually, the, the company doesn't really bear the cost of the pollution, right? Um, and that cost is usually transferred onto society, right? Unless the only way a company would, be, would bear the cost of the pollution is, is if they get sued for something like nuisance, right? But other than that, the, the cost is transferred onto society and we bear the cost of that negative social impact. The, the converse of that, the other, the opposite thing to think about is positive externality, which is the, the example that's always given um, is, is the lighthouse, right? And that's the famous um, lighthouse example that, that Ronald, Go Ronald Coase gave about the positive externalities or the positive social impact that's produced by a lighthouse that is contributing and making, um, you know, giving good things to society by providing navigational light and all that so that they can travel safely. But who is going to create a lighthouse if they cannot, if there's nobody who's going to fund the cost of um, that benefit, right? The cost of producing that benefit. And, and there's a whole body of work in academia about how we can do that, that I'm not going into today. But what I wanted to do with, with this exercise is to get us thinking about how do we reduce our negative impact and the negative externalities and how do we increase the positive externalities from our businesses? Um, why, why, does, why is that conversation important? Why does it matter? It, it matters because on two levels, right? So as an academic, we always think of, okay, the, the, normative, the normative statements, right? It should matter because it's the right thing to do. It should matter because businesses should do this, be, be socially responsible. But I wanted to highlight that that is no longer a normative statement that we are looking at. You know, creating social impact have, has now become a descriptive thing. It, it's people are becoming more and more aware of the importance of actually creating social, social impact. And we see that with the sustainable development goals, that, that there are 17 goals that the, the UN has um, identified that we need to implement by 2030 to actually transform the world. So I have some friends here, Claudia, um, Scarlett, I think, if you're here, but, but we're working on how do, we, how do we achieve these goals within the US and within the international community in 10 years, right? So, so we're no longer talking about social impact as, as a normative value, like something good that we should try to achieve. It, it is something that we need to do now. It's not a, it's not a descriptive um, endeavor. And sorry, it's not a normative endeavor anymore. It's a descriptive endeavor now. So, so the reason why it's become descriptive is because we, we are seeing trends in the world that, that people are more willing to engage with businesses that are sustainable and who have actually a positive mission. So 
there was a study by Deloitte that says that shows that three out of four millennials and, and Gen Zers, which make up 59% of the global employee base, they actually want to work for companies that are driven by purpose and that make meaningful contributions to society. What that means for us, uh, for businesses, is that if you want to retain, to attract and retain the best employees, you actually need to start thinking about the impact that you're having on the world. Number two, companies that emphasize social impact tend to generate long-term um, return, return on investments for themselves and for the world in that if they are producing positive impact on the world, what happens is they, they tend to have more loyal customers. Think Patagonia, for example. They tend to have customers that are willing to pay more for their products. They tend to attract better employees and employees that are willing to stay with them. Uh, so, so, so it's no longer a, it's no longer, social impact is no longer something that companies should do, right? Companies that are doing social impact tend to see this, um, tend, to, tend to, to, to recover or recoup this market rewards. Um, and then the third thing that I wanted to share is that it was so interesting that at the start of the pandemic, uh, companies that were focused on sustainability, sustainability and, and were rated high on um, sustainability found their shares um, outperforming S&P 500 um, companies during the pandemic. So this is really interesting. So, so what I'm trying to say is that the social impact is no longer something that, you know, that, that we should do, right? We've moved out of the should so this is something that we actually have to do that, that needs to happen. Um, and so, and so, so that's, that's the importance of why, of, of this conversation, right? And the last slide that I have before, you know, we, we, we start this conversation is that, is that how can a social enterprise create social impact? So a social enterprise can be a nonprofit um, or a business that is geared towards um, a social mission, right? So the, there are four different concepts of social impact that was provided by Ashoka. So Ashoka is a, uh, is a nonprofit organization that was founded by Bill, Bill uh, Drayton. So he is considered the founder on, and the father of social entrepreneurs. And, he provi and Ashoka provided four different ways in which a social enterprise can create social impact. So one way a social enterprise can create social impact is to provide a direct service to a community that is in need, right? So for example, you see a poor community that is lacking in educational resources. You go there and you build a school, right? Or you see, um, a community that is poor and who cannot afford medical services, you go there and you build a hospital, right? So those are direct services that are provided to a community. Uh, in some situations that can be scaled, right? So for example, Teachers Without Borders, Doctors Without Borders is a good example of how you can scale a direct service um, so that it reaches more people in more communities. Um, for my conversations, that's not that easy to do because apparently um, this this was new to me, but I had a conversation with a um, an impact investor that said that if if a direct service model works with one community, people tend to be jealous about that model and they tend to be competitive and they don't want to scale it, which is really interesting because that seems to go against the you know the notion of um, you know wanting to do social good, um, but that's an interesting concept. Um, but that's one way, right? You have direct service and then you have scaled direct service. The other way that, um, that a lot of people focus on is to actually change the system that is preventing um, you know, communities from, from having access to resources or the systems that are keeping some communities in poverty or the, system, the systems that are keeping um, you know, some communi communities without access to good education, right? So we, we work on not, not 
providing direct services, but changing the system. One good example is a lot of companies are more involved with um, having um, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion policies, right, and implementing that. So you're changing the systems that have actually kept some communities marginalized and and not part of the, um, you know, not not an integral part of the the business or the economy. Right, and I have here. Sometimes you might think about changing systems that would that have prevented kids underprivileged kids from having access to the internet, right? So we need to, to think in innovative ways about how do we change the systems that have kept kids from having internet access, right? So we might think about, you know, can we have more computers in libraries, right? And be innovative about how we would fund that, right? Can we have more, have more internet cafes, right? Who can we ask to give more computers, right? Things like that, where you actually change the system um, that, that's creating the, the, the social problem. And the, the last one is, is where you engage in activities that actually change an entire, changes an entire uh, framework, right? So you would engage in an activity that, for example, you might, you might work on implementing one of the sustainable development goals, right? Or you might work with, um, an organization that is actually trying to change complete frameworks. Um, and, and the reason why I have the, the sustainable development goals here is because that's the aim of the SDGs, right? To really, to really change and, um, and transform the inequities and the poverty and the hunger that we see um, in the world. Um, Ashoka gives the example of democracy as, as the framework change, right, where you, you realize that there is a political, um, um, you know, well, one political system isn't working as well as others, so you change the entire political system, right, so democracy is an example that um, Ashoka gives. So, so that's the concept of social impact and what it can do. Uh, what we can do and what social enterprises can do to actually change um, uh, the way society is structured. Um, so that, that's what I, I wanted to, to, to start the conversation with um, and then open the floor to, to see what, what people are thinking about social impact, if they are at all. Um, and and some of the work that they are doing in the, the field um, to create impact. And, and I also want to encourage people as they hear other people speak to reach out to them if they feel that there is room for collaboration or they could work together to pursue a common goal, right? So, so I know um, some of the individuals in the audience um, are very connected with social impact. Um, and I, I'm, I know that some, this may be a new, a new thing, or you might, you might have heard of social impact and, and it, um, it seemed interesting, but you never really got involved, right? Or never had the opportunity to, to get involved. Um, yeah, I wanna hear your stories. And, and, any, and of course, any questions that you, you may have. So oh, I, I'm, I'm gonna. Ah, oh, you wanna speak? Sorry. Go ahead. So sorry, I didn't wanna interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was just um, saying that um, Alina and I have worked together through Catalyst 2030, and uh, we are work are in between systems change and framework change. So as um, a social enterprise here. I'm under the 501c3, which is the nonprofit status. And in our case, um, it's not very easy to, for instance, be recognized and capture funds in under the 501c3. So right now we are uh, creating some programs that are um, paid uh, by the users. Now we have one called SDG Impact Pledge, where we invite 
the business, the local business community in Miami to go through uh, a year um, sustainability training with the involvement with the community of partners. So uh, it's very interesting that Alina, you have outlined just as Ashoka does. And um, my point is, do you see that companies or organizations under the 501c3 could leave the stigma, sorry, the, the charity stigma, uh, or it's more interested to migrate to a B Corp formation, for instance? Yeah, that, sorry, that, that's such a, an interesting conversation because it's an interesting question because um, when, when we talk about charity, at, at least for me, and I'm, I'm sure that other people here would, would have a different, would have their view as well. When we, when we think about, when someone says charity, we all, I always think of, um, of the charity providing free services. You know what I mean? It, it's very hard. Once you position yourself as a charity, I think it's very hard to then ask the public for money because, because there is the expectation that the charity will provide, right? So there, there is this concept where, where, where people will free ride on the positive benefits that you're doing for as long as they can. If there is no way to capture uh, if there, there's no way to capture money from them, then they were free ride for as long as as possible. And and that's a concept that we that we talk a lot in, in the intellectual property community. I know Shuba is here, and Shuba may have some thoughts as well. But but if you are uh, providing positive benefits as a charity, like the lighthouse, unless you have a way to exclude people from the benefits of your program it's going to be very hard to charge them. And your next question was, should, should you incorporate as a B Corp? Um, so this is my thoughts. I, I think the B Corp is a very new um, business entity, but I think there is, people are more willing to pay a B Corp than they would a nonprofit charitable organization. Shuba, do you have any thoughts? Uh, first of all, Alina, I think this is such a great project. So thank you for for launching it, and uh, it's good to um, to uh, to be participating. Uh, I think there's so much here. Um, I don't I don't have any really direct thoughts about the B Corp versus the Benefit Corporation. I think one needs to think about you know the community one wants to organize in the state, um, what types of uh, services and how they will be provided. They can vary, and that this might be a longer conversation, uh, not an overwhelming one, but maybe longer than what we see here. I know not all states recognize the B Corporation. I know there may be some limits, um, but certainly the, um, you know, the, uh, the tax treatment of nonprofits is going through a lot of changes, as I know. So I think one needs to be alert to that. Um, but uh, but the broader question, I guess, as part of the conversation, not to not to um, change the direction about uh, about what the social impact, what it means for me, uh, for my work. Um, I work the, with the tech commercialization program here in Syracuse University in upstate New York, and it's something that I've done uh, in other universities as well. Like, like Alina, I mean, I'm a professor at a law school, but I'm very much uh, connected with, with business schools as well and, and, and engineering. Um, and so I think the biggest social impact issue is how do you get, um, you know, people who have ideas, how do you get them to, to develop them in ways that realize that impact? Um, the one, um, the one uh, that qu I guess quibble I would have with the externality approach is that externalities are often are unconscious. I think uh, they happen. <laughs> uh, Companies, organizations are seeking profits, but there are these other external, you know, negative costs and positive benefits that that are realized. But when you're talking about social impact, I think the, the starting point should be that it's more goal oriented. We, we have certain goals. We know that we want to have certain types of impacts, uh, and I see social impact as, as partly a question of um, 
you know, understanding other goals, a broader sense of social accounting in terms of how we uh, do business, first of all, but just how we organize uh, the various activities that, that we do. So um, I think where I, where I come from with this is on this issue of, um, of uh, tapping creativity, you know, tapping um, innovation and entrepreneurship. I and mean, we're doing this in sort of a university context in upstate New York um, with the State University of New York system with various private universities like RPI. But I think there are other organizations too that um, you know, how do you tap students, uh, not just simply uh, individuals who are working in, uh, in uh, research labs or other types of, um, of incubator type settings. Um, I've often thought in the, during this COVID period, we had a lot of very entrepreneurial students who had thought about ways to, to market and develop PPEs and and try to fill that need. And I think that's going to continue in lots of various ways when we're thinking about just ge generally educating people about, um, about pandemics, about the vaccines, about what's going to happen. So I, I think there's just so many goals to, to consider and where I think um, our dialogue, where, where organizations um, like, you, like you're doing, uh, Alina, is really trying to channel and identify the various communities and various settings, and then probably map with, um, you know, with um, professionals, with people who are, who are active, who have common interests, who have certain skill sets, you know, to try to, to, to do this in a more constructive and cohesive and long-term way. So that's what I was so excited to hear about uh, uh, this enterprise, Alina, so thank you. Thanks, thanks, Shubha. Um, and, and I hope that you can get more involved as we progress, and maybe take part in some of the events where we try to combine academic research with, with business. Um, and and I, I would love for you to, um, to join us. Uh, uh, Claudia, with, with respect to the question on, on the B Corp and the charity, I, I saw some comments in the chat that I I thought were quite good. Um, and I, I hope you can attend the next event, but let's, let's try to address the issue with funding and how to fund social enterprises at the next event. And, and, um, and we can have a more extensive discussion. Um, I, and I have another colleague here, Christoph Henkel, um, who does work with, with um, institutions at, um, in, in, in the B Corp and nonprofits and, and business organization who um, might have some insights as well. I don't know if he's still here, but- I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, I can chime in real quick mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just a general observation in terms of what Cla Claudia asked about it, the, her twofold question really. Um, in terms of entity choice, right? As a non-for-profit, you oftentimes just run into a problem. You you might be uh, uh, might have available. You, you might be able to access grant money and certain funding, but at some point you will hit a ceiling, and uh, it becomes more difficult uh, to secure the funding. Um, it might be easier to start off as a non-for-profit, but uh, eventually it might become more difficult depending on how um, you scale of develop with the B Corp it's reverse right so the start might be more difficult in terms of getting funding but you're more flexible because it's similar to a corporation um, and you have you can have similar um, benefits in terms of taxation and to some degree it can be even better it depends on how it's set up um, but you know it, it it really depends also on what you're trying to do right what the what the goal is um, and this is something that uh, Shuba referred right? So some of these goals, and this is just something from my, my observation, is a lot of uh, millennials and Gen Zs and students and others that I work with, entrepreneurs, for them, um, the social impact and sustainability is a natural, right? Um, they they uh, pursue this without necessarily thinking about it. Um, and so in that sense, I think it is really important to help them continue on that, and this is the biggest challenge, right, with, with these um, uh, early startups and entrepreneurs, because once they get 
a job at let's say a tech company like Apple or somewhere else, um, they don't have necessarily the interest or the time to pursue their um, their their projects um, that they are um, so committed to. Right, that's one point. Now, with regard to the other question that uh, Claudia raised in terms of um, uh, commercializing, um, I do think there is an increased erosion uh, there. What I mean by this is that you can see um, a lot of companies that start out with um, uh, with a sustainability goal or uh, with a social impact purpose um, uh, to to go more into the commercial arena, and this has to do with uh, funding, right? And I can give you an example. Uh, Versity Tutors, for example, they want to now go public. It's a company that provides um, online teaching access um, to uh, the, you know, um, to people who don't necessarily have access to other educational institutions. Um, and so it's, it's a very important um, business or a goal that they set for themselves, but they now want to go public. And the way they do this, they do this with what's called a spec or open um, a plank chair company. Uh, and this is where I'm seeing this, right? So where a lot, a lot of investors are now focusing on these um, companies that are pursuing these goals because they are doing better, because of the commitment that the people have that uh, uh, work in these businesses. So I do think there is an erosion there and there's a possibility there that some of this is lost if it is commercialized like this and if they you know, lose control over these businesses. But we can talk about this more in another session. I just wanted to throw this in here. I hope, I hope that helped, Claudia. Um, that's, that's such a good question. Um, and I, I saw there were some comments from Kathleen and Gary about merging both the profit and the nonprofit. And I, I, always, I always think personally, I always think it's easier to ask people for money when you are positioned as a, as a business as, a, as opposed to a charity. Because people always think, or I, I always think when it's a charity, it's, it's a charity, you know what I mean? Yeah, that was such a, a good conversation. Um, and any other thoughts? I know, um, any other thoughts I had? Uh, let me see. So, Sagonia, I know, I know you, do, you do a bit of, I, I, you do a lot of social impact work in, in England. What do you think? Hmm. Maybe maybe you stepped out. Um, yeah. Do you? Does anyone have any other thoughts about about um, social impact? What about Vero? Vero, are you here? I see your I see your comment about um, being a fan of social impact move, movement. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm Claudia's number one fan. <laughs> <laughs> How? I I, I admire the, the, the organization mission a lot. I think they are doing a great job teaching us all about the, the sustainable development goals. And I try to, to participate and, and support all the, the activities they, they do. And uh, I also uh, help other organizations with the women empowerment, the SDG number five, <laughs> gender equality. Uh, and uh, I'm part of the the board of uh, Miami Youth Orchestra mm -hmm. because I, I think the the access to uh, arts and education it, it, it's very important and, and it helps kids a lot to with their academic uh, performances mm -hmm. um, and also uh, I'm a partner at the uh, uh, Roy Marketing Institute. And we created a partnership with uh, Claudia and Social Impact Movement to, to support the, the, I think it was in your chart seven, the one that, that you are showing now, mm -hmm. uh, helping companies to uh, prove the positive impact of uh, supporting the sustainable development goals in their, in their profits, in their business results. And uh, that way, getting 
approval for higher bud budgets to to invest more and uh, and creative creating even more impact. So uh, I think that is a key success factor. <laughs> I will. Uh, yeah, I, I love what I, I loved everything you've just said because the what what you've just desc just described is that you don't necessarily need to start a business or an entity to actually go out and achieve one of the goals, right? The goals can actually be achieved within the company itself. Like, so you can solve the issue of no poverty by actually trying to hire people that are in impoverished areas within your, your company, right? Or you could address the meeting. You don't have to actually have a company that specifically deals with whose business is to address let's just say no hunger, no poverty, right? You can actually do that within your business structure itself. Without yeah, well, I, I think there is a huge opportunity in, mm -hmm. in the previous discussion of non-profit and for-profit. Mm -hmm. There is a huge opportunity in for-profit with a purpose. Yeah. And I think there is a sweet intersection there that is uh, currently unexploited. Yep. But I think there is a lot of room for, for growth there and try mainly when you are trying to target companies that they really care in they are not just saying oh i'm doing this i'm doing that because it, it looks good to say to to say that <laughs> when, purpose, purpose, when they are authentic yeah. and they really care i think uh, you have you find that that intersection of companies that uh, they are for profit but they are interested in making an impact you know i love that vero um there, there is a, so I'm, I'm based in Mississippi and there is a company in Mississippi that produces bath products like luxurious bath products like bath bombs and soaps and everything um, and that's their business and they make money from that but the people that they employ are ex exclusively from vulnerable communities meaning women who have been in prison women who have been subject to domestic abuse right or, or women who are in shelters because if you're in a shelter you have to keep your identity secret right so it's hard to get a job but but this company employs them so they they are achieving they are achieving the goals but without directly saying that okay or without having a business that actually addresses the goals does that make sense right because what what yeah. they're doing is yeah and and i love what you say for profit with a mission i i love that uh flynn i see that you have your hand up did you have a comment Yes, thank you. I have a question uh, that surrounds intellectual property and entrepreneurial uh, social economic startups. Um, how, I, without even, I don't, I probably don't even need to ask a question. I know that this is maybe something that you can tell me questions that I don't even know. So can you speak on that a little bit? Uh, that's a that's a very general question. Um, Let me be more specific. Yeah. Um, the so we all know that the need for scalable solutions to drive social impact um, is ginormous. No matter where we live in our world today, it is only increasing, mm -hmm. and it is not just the person looking to start up a new nonprofit to help a specific uh, need, unmet need or uh, need that needs to be met with uh, a new idea. Uh, but it's also the corporations that have been around for hundreds of years um, and everything in between as well. Um, there are a lot of people that are visionaries and entrepreneurs, artists uh, that have ideas and maybe they are not within any one of those categories but they're not in charge of a large company and they are not wanting to do a small nonprofit um, but they have an idea that might change the world or do play its part in changing the world um, when they go out and start looking for avenues to place that or to pitch that product or pitch that idea um, when most likely they will run into cohorts and different uh, development labs that are going to want that person to expose their IP. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people that I've seen 
are in a position where maybe they're college students and they um, just have not created enough wealth yet to be able to fund their idea and secure it, go to um, a patent attorney or a uh, copyright attorney or whatever it may be, um, and goes through the process that uh, you would for most other ideas, like if you invented a new machine, for instance. Um, so what do those people do when they are sitting at, um, generally it's a form, <laughs> it starts with a form generally. Um, what is your idea? Um, it, an accelerator application or something like that. And I get a sense of nervousness from a lot of people, a lot of these entrepreneurs, per se, you know, uh, just making that word up. I don't know what your word might be, but social impact entrepreneur, maybe. Um, and they don't want to necessarily give their idea to a group of people who they do not already have a relationship with. And maybe they're attached to it. Maybe they really are passionate about that idea. Um, so how can they, when we have a world of uh, VC and um, other types of angel investment cohorts that are looking to uh, have people pitch without IP protection, basically, um, how should someone go into that uh with the current state of affairs being as it is. I mean, most people will not, most investors will not listen to an idea if they have to sign a bunch of pieces of the paperwork about a non-disclosure because that puts them in conflict later on down the road, perhaps if they um, decide not to do business with this entrepreneur. Um, so can you possibly give me some examples of what you've seen and what, mentality maybe that someone who is wanting to see how far their idea may go in the market um, can best protect themselves? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And and, and, and you're right. Lina, uh, yes. Lina, can I say something there? Of course. But yeah, Chris, so, so, and Shuba might be able to say something about this too. This is a question I get quite often. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. And um, it's it's uh, first of all, it's it's really a legal question, right? Um, and has it's a typical question for startups, right? And there are various things that you can do uh, to protect your intellectual property, right? Um, and uh, I think there's just a misconception among a lot of startups that they can protect their IP when they speak to an investor. There are various ways to do that. Um, I don't necessarily want to go into these specific. Uh, um, ways in which you can do that, uh, but there are good ways to do that, and there are organizations, and there, there are non-for-profit organizations and uh, social impact organizations who provide uh, legal services for these uh, um, scenarios, uh, but I think this is just an educational issue, um, and, uh, you know, I, I run across this when, when I work with entrepreneurs with startups, um, and uh, you know, sometimes uh, taking a risk to disclose something might also be worth it. It depends on what, of course, it is. But um, I think because this is a legal question, you have to you have to really look at what the specific idea entails and how you uh, how you protect that intellectual property. But that's a very common question. Um, Shuba, is our other is also an intellectual property professor. I, I don't know if he's still here and has any thoughts. Shubha, do you have um, any Sorry, I was, um, I'm still here, I'm still here. Um, yeah, I'd be glad to, um, I had to drop out for a little bit, but uh, yeah, I'd be glad to, uh, uh, you know, address any specific questions. Um, what was on, so, sorry. So, right, so the question was, how can you protect your intellectual property when you're talking to investors who, who generally do not want to sign a non-disclosure agreement? Yeah. Well, I, um, uh, there are trade secrets um, that would exist in these if you haven't patented them. Um, I'd have to think about the specific invention, specific idea. I think, um, you know, absent an, an actual non-disclosure agreement, there might be implied non-disclosure agreements uh, based upon the, the context and the context of the parties. 
but I think uh, the way is really to view this as a long-term relationship and uh, to try to develop the trust and to, um, you know, to make the disclosures as effectively but as carefully as possible so that you're not, you know, giving away <laughs> more than you have to at any point in, the, in, the, in, in that relationship, in that business relationship. Um, the patent applications uh, can be helpful having filed those and obviously pursued them. But I think largely it's a question of, um, you know, the invention is not a static uh, thing. I mean, it may change over time, it develop as you understand markets for it. So while things like patents are, are, are helpful and have their place, it, they can also serve to, um, you know, to make things a little bit too rigid and maybe not as uh, fluid as, as they uh, could be in terms of trying to, you know, develop an invention and then market. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Shubha. It, I think it's it's important. The, the point Shubha made about um, trust in business relationship, I think especially in the social impact world uh, is, is really important. Um, and and I guess this is this is a, just a non-formal comment, you know. Like there's there's the formal comment that all academics will give you, and then there's the the informal comment. I think I think you need to separate the or to be able to identify the people that will take advantage of you. What's what's generally called like the sharks, and and separate them from the people who who genuinely want to help you, you know, the the dolphins. So you you want to avoid um, you want you want to be able to know who are who would take your idea and run with it, and try to limit interaction with them and not disclose, and then build slowly build relationships of trust with people that you think can support you, and then as the relationship develops, then you slowly disclose more and more. Um, that that's kind of like the, like the informal answer besides the academic. Uh, responses like my my response would would be the same as what Shuba and and Christoph say, you know, formally, but but on a on a softer soft scale level, I would um, I would I would say that. Um, yes. Okay. Well, I would I would just add one other thing from my experience to the, in terms of building that trust, which is so important, right? There are incubators that focus yeah. on B corporations and uh, companies uh, that are have uh, that focus on social impact. And mm -hmm. I think that's probably the best starting point in order to find that community that you can can trust more. Of course, when you uh, when you um, go further and you work with 1871 or uh, XCOM in California, you have to read um, their contracts, right? And you might need some advice in terms of how once uh, they invest, uh, uh, you need to kind of uh, inform yourself and these invest uh, uh, these inventors need to inform themselves. But I think the best starting point in order to build these relationships are these um, uh, incubators that focus, for example, on B Corps in the Delaware Valley, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a good point about trust. Um, so I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and make sure that we end on time. So, so, so um, I, want to, I want to keep this conversation going um, over the course of the summer. So, so information about us, um, the, here's the, the uh, website that you can visit. And if you, if you want to chat with me, there is a link to my calendar on the website. And then here's my, my email address. But I really want to encourage you to attend the next session, Being Financially Sustainable, that Ryan will lead. Um, and that's two weeks from today. And I'm presuming one o'clock, um, but, but the, the event will be sent out through LinkedIn as well. And the last thing that I wanted to mention, there was a, there was a question about uh, whether the slides will be made available. Uh, so I'll make the slides available to the link, the LinkedIn page as well. So if you go to the LinkedIn event page where you you got the link to come in, um, or you get the the invitation um, for the event, I'll put the slides up there. So that there was a question that was asked. So um, the slides will be av available there. Right. So so I hope to see you guys, everyone, again next in in two weeks, um, and and keep the conversation going. So that by the end of the summer, 
uh, you know, we, we have the tools and resources we need to, to be able to then, um, you know, run with our social enterprises. So thank you and um, have a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you, Lina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.